Well, I think uh, my father was somewhat visionary in basically thinking up the idea or foreseeing the idea of the internet. And his, his um, background, he had a PhD in audition in hearing, uh, was an experimental psychologist. And he went to MIT and started their experimental psychology program. Uh, and then he left academia to go work for Bolt, Baronic, and Newman as a, a human factors person who understood, who, who specialized in hearing, uh, in signals that airlines could use, that pilots could use, that were audible under the circumstances they were in. And, um, but at Bolt, Baronic, and Newman, he, they got a computer. And he, he rapidly and radically transformed himself into a computer pro person. Uh, and he just was enthralled with computers that were then effectively personal computers. They just took up a room smaller than this, but it needed some space and air conditioning and all kinds of things. Um, but they weren't multi-user. And so basically, it was a personal computer, just a big one. Uh, and he became very uh, infatuated with this and thought a lot about it. And he wrote a paper in the 60s um, that basically envisioned not the internet per se as today, but basically the, the concept of an, an internet. Um, shortly after that, he was picked to go to Washington uh, to work in what was then ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, before it became DARPA. Uh, and he worked for what was called the Information Processing Techniques Office. And he was given a bunch of money. Uh, and he went about the country kind of proselytizing his idea and involving lots of people at universities, at places like Bell Labs and Xerox Park, um, getting them on board. And he, because he had this pot of money, he could fund initial development of many things that became the initial ARPANET. Um, and it wasn't like today. I mean, there was still an investment in basic research, which has basically disappeared from the United States and most of the world. Everything is purpose-driven, commercially purpose-driven research, or you know, the money just isn't there uh, in government thinking or whatever to, f to fund people who aren't going to make a quicker car in two years or tastier peanut butter or whatever. Um, but at that time, there was. And, and so no one really knew what this was going to mean. In fact, the established telecommunications players wanted n explicitly wanted nothing to do with it. You know, uh, AT&T um, and IBM just had no interest at all. Uh, and besides writing, writing this, I mean, the, the other contribution really was funding a lot of um, the researchers. He funded Xerox Park. Uh, no, I mean, I don't mean exclusively, but he gave money to researchers who were doing things, working on protocols, working on. Uh, initially, the ARPANET was a collection. At that time, there was a diversity of computers, diversity of mainframes. It wasn't like today where you know IBM makes mainframes and nobody else does. There were a handful of companies that were making mainframe computers and a sp smattering of, of mini computers. Um, but originally, the internet consisted of a bunch of little computers that were all the same, and they could communicate with each other. They were called imps for interface message processors. And the, the group at BBN got a, a letter from um, uh, Ed Kennedy's office saying what a great idea it was that they were working on an interfaith message processor to you know, improve religious tolerance and understanding. But it was an interface messenger, uh, um, an, um, a pro message processor. And then each one of these machines was programmed idiosyncratically to talk to its host. So you had a, 
a ring of computers that were, maybe you all know all this, I should just stop. Uh, but you had a ring of computers that were all identical, that did the internet protocol. And then they would translate all that specifically for whatever idiosyncrasies there, that the host computer had. Um, and so it wasn't truly all these p computers themselves running a protocol to talk to each other. They just had a special purpose program written for them that would let them talk to this ring of, of imps. And of course, eventually that changed, and, and, and the function of the imp was pushed back into the different computers uh, once there were well-established protocols. Um, it became incumbent on any, anybody who made a machine had to, or, or the software for a machine, had to get TCP IP in it and do that. Um, I think um, those are really the two, two aspects of what he did to think of and catalyze. His real concept of the internet was as an information utility. And I, um, it's clear, he, no one could. He didn't foresee the explosion of the internet and to be such a dominant economic and social force that it is. In fact, when you talk to any of the original people, they admit they had no clue where this was going to go. Um, and I think he thought of it more as a library. Uh, and he was very keen on having people have access to all, all information. Uh, and this was going to be a great resource. Uh, people around the world could access the best information, people at home, although it was much less a home-based thing. There wasn't a World Wide Web yet. Um, but you know, scientists and researchers could share papers instantly, and you could be in some, you'd be in some small country, not particularly developed, and still have access to the same knowledge that was uh, available uh, in the U.S. And uh, but um, that's kind of that's kind of it. I remember as a kid, when I was about five, he would take my sister and me to Bolt Veronica Newman to give my mother a break on Saturdays. And at one point I had the job, one of the first computers they got, uh, and in this era, mainly they, they all did, used punch paper tape to, you loaded, first you loaded a, a bootstrap loader, and then that made, put a program in, in the computer's memory that could read the real program. And so you would put in the bootstrap loader, then you would run, say, the text editor, You'd read that tape in, and then you'd read in a third tape, which was your document so far. And then you'd edit it, and then you get it would punch out the new version on the paper tape. And my one of my jobs was to roll up the paper tape <clears throat> and put a rubber band around it and put it back on the pegboard um, when I was a kid. And I earned a nickel a day, and um, you could buy a candy bar in the Bolt Baranca Newman vending machine for a nickel. So it was, it was, it was perfect. Um, anyway, that's, that's kind of what my dad did. Um, he, uh, after that stint, he was in and out of government uh, working on computer-related uh, things, internet-related things. He was in the Office of Naval Research. He was in, um, I don't even remember. Uh, I, I, I got off to school, and he was still going in and out of government and computer-related uh, roles. Uh, he, he left government to go to the IBM Watson Research Lab. He thought it was too dull and too applied. I mean, it was all product-oriented. And he was very much an uh, innovative, creative mind. And he would talk to people about things, and they'd just think he was a hopeless romantic or, you know, just too much of a free thinker for IBM. So he did the trick of getting IBM to appoint him as a visiting professor at MIT and pay for it. Um, and then eventually when he was at MIT, he um, became a, a, a faculty member, and he ran the lab for computer science uh, pretty much till the end of his life. Um, and there was a lot of innovative stuff there at, at MIT. 
they developed one of the first time sharing systems uh, and also did a lot of internet related stuff. Well, I think you know the the key one that most people would point to is the vision uh, that that he had um, fairly early on. Uh, his his idea was the title of it was man machine symbiosis, which sounds a little bit weird, not a catchy uh, bestseller list type title. But I think what transformed him was his experiences with these early computers sitting there, being there, and seeing the way that a computer could augment a, a, a person's productivity. And he saw, he, his idea was that these things could be developed to help people do things and it sort of advance the capabilities of people to do better research, more research, find out about things more quickly, keep track of things. Um, of course, there was also email, uh, not, not that he invented it, but um, that sort of melded into the idea of the early internet. And this idea of fostering communications among scientists and researchers and computer, as it expanded, it got some computer industry uh, uh, manufacturers, you know, IBM, Digital Equipment Corporation, which no longer is uh, involved. So I think what most people would recognize him for there was that, and then there was the part when he was in government initially where he was basically uh, a preacher and went around proselytizing the vision of an, which he actually called intergalactic network. Uh, and he was a funny guy. I mean, he, he on purpose called it intergalactic just for fun. And since it was an engineering crowd, you can get away with some somewhat weird jokes or weird points of view. Um, but I think his funding people was critical. Uh, I mean, if he hadn't, um, it may have happened later, but I think getting it going uh, was key. And I think it was you know, a very, uh, was a confluence of, of many things. You, this couldn't happen in government today. Um, there's no sort of like, we'll give you some money and you don't have to really account for it by saying, I did this and this and this. And certainly at the time, most people in government didn't know what to make of this. And uh, he, there were some military bases or, or military bases that had research facilities on the internet and he would go there uh, as part of his proselytizing mission. And they had, a, when he was in the, ARPA was in the Defense Department, so he had a civilian rank. And this caused no end of confusion for the military. Uh, and he actually went with someone outranking him, actually a, a, a military man. Uh, but they'd gotten the protocol orders mixed up and to, my dad was the leader of the group. And so no matter how much this, this uh, military guy protested, um, they kept kowtowing to my father, and uh, uh, one of his visits, they were showing him some missile, and he said, oh, I'll bet you can really Grinch them with that. And as we were kids, he'd been reading the Dr. Zeus book about the Grinch who stole Christmas. But the military people didn't understand, and they thought it was a technical word that none of them knew what to make of, so they sent like a sergeant running off to um, go find out what this word meant. Because they were sort of saying, yeah, I, I guess. But they didn't really understand what he was talking about. And it was, and he had a lot of experiences like that. He, he was kind of, uh, certainly for government, certainly for the military, uh, a, a crazy guy. And uh, he also liked to drink Coke for breakfast, which at that time was a pretty radical. I think he would say uh, cloudy, uh, maybe worse. Um, I think um, he would be up, upset about, well, he would ups, be upset about nation state policies, the US included, where 
the internet was being perverted into a security tool, uh, a control, an information control tool. So you have countries where, like Iran, that doesn't like what the word world says on the internet, so they want to cut it off and create their own internal private internet that's only that's controlled by Iranian people, and in particular the government. So nobody gets to say bad <clears throat> relative to their point of view, bad things or controversial things. Uh, and in many cases where there's been student uprisings or political discontent, companies just shut off the internet. And he would be, I mean, his vision was very idealistic and very optimistic. And the fact that you could take something that was meant to give access to everyone, but to you know, the common knowledge of mankind, uh, he would find it very difficult uh, to see that. And also, I think he would, to some extent, be surprised that uh, that business has hijacked the internet in a certain sense, that the entertainment industry, uh, I'll just pick on them, but other, uh, other industries too, that have basically exploited that uh, sort of delivery vehicle that was made not really with them in mind, but they have gained such a dominant position uh, in dictating how and where the internet goes. And I think he would be upset about um, the cookie tracking, I mean, the survey, not, he would be very upset about the NSA surveillance, but he would be very upset about the commercial surveillance or building dossiers. Uh, you know, most people are utterly unaware. I mean, you know, they go to Google, they go to Amazon. All of this is recorded. And if you buy a book about baby, about parenting on Amazon, all of a sudden, you know, you're looking at diapers and cribs and, you know, they've decided where you are. And, you know, they figure out, you know, from your zip code uh, what, your, what your demographics are and figure, well, here's a good one. Let's, let, here's a keeper uh, where somebody else might show up and be from less affluent zip code and not buying baby products, but something kind of. They say, well, this is much less interesting. Um, but I think he would be upset, particularly at the, the fact that it's done in a way that virtually everyone doesn't know anything about it. That it's, to most people, computers and the internet are magic. And it never occurs to them, you know, that they're giving up any information. Or, or it's even the case where, oh, well, it is the case that most people want stuff. And they'd actually be troubled by the fact if a website was honest and said, look, in exchange for letting you get the stuff off our website, we're going to take some information from you and keep it. And um, most people say, it annoys me that you ask that question, because I really just want to go to the stuff. Um, so they, most people would prefer that all this complexity and legality wasn't disclosed to them. They just, you know, I just, I just want to see the, you know, I want to see, get this song off iTunes or Amazon or someplace. Don't bother me with me. Uh, don't bother me with all this stuff. And um, so it's a bit ironic. But I think he would see the lack of privacy, the lack of, especially the lack of security um, in the internet as problematic. And the fact that now, big powers, uh, nation states, uh, intelligence agencies, um, have a lot of control uh, and surveillance of what was supposed to be an open and free um, enterprise. Well, I think it's so antithetical to his basic idea that this was going to be a free a, a, a distribution system that was unfettered, where you could, I mean, it was a somewhat naive, I mean, point of view at the time, um, because basically you were dealing with a cohort of researchers who wanted to share everything with each other. 
And they were, you know, one group with one agenda. And when it was opened up to the world, when the World Wide Web came along, all of a sudden you got thousands, if not millions, of groups that had interests in how things played out and, um, you know, sort of bent it or exploited it in their own, their own ways commercially so that it wasn't free and it wasn't um, open to everyone. And you had to pay this price of losing your privacy. Um, and also, I think it, the, part of the problem is the, the internet was developed in this naive, isolated environment where security wasn't an issue. And, you know, it's well established that if you develop computer systems and try to tack on security after the fact, it's almost impossible. The only, the only secure systems are one where you start out uh, and in the original design concept, you attach high importance to security. Um, and if you don't do that, it's virtually impossible to go back. The horse is out of the barn and it's hard to stick them back in and you know, provide uh, a secure framework. And people are scrambling in, in the internet technical world to figure out how to get the horse back in the barn and provide secure protocols. And also, what's happened in, in both computer science and the advent of better and better computers, fast, more powerful computers, a lot of the protocols that have stood up over time to provide some degree of security are, have been attacked more and more and more and are seemingly, more, I mean, basically in the internet, the, you know, using secure sockets layer, where you get a little padlock on your URL, is really the, the only line of defense, really, from keeping everything from just being public, everything you do or say, being public in plain text everywhere. And it's being attacked. And yesterday I was reading about some attacks that let people gain partial information from encrypted communications, but worst of all, the important information, like stealing your password or stealing your social security number, um, that it facilitates doing that. It's not really a tool for finding out exactly what you said. You said, mom, I don't like baked beans. Don't make them for me when I come home. It's not for doing that. It's really targeted at getting critical pieces of information, your password, your Wi-Fi password, your bank account, and there's this whole you know, enterprise of thievery. Well, I think he was very utopian, and he, he thought um, this would be a vehicle for taking the, be you know, the best, most authoritative information about everything uh, and getting it freely available to, to everyone. And I think he would be... Uh, that was his great hope. I think he'd be disappointed that it's so fettered. Um, and, you know, most people use it. Uh, I mean, they, you know, you can say, where's a Chinese, you can talk to Siri and say, where's a Chinese restaurant within a mile of here? And that's getting information, and that's perfectly fine. But I think he was thinking more about knowledge and um, not getting commercial recommendations about where to go to eat or, um, or basically um, doing things where you're doing something uh, where you're giving away information about yourself to get some service. Well, I think there'd be two main things. One, I think he would really want um, the internet engineering group to engineer, re-engineer protocols. The people are never, I think, going to understand the security countermeasures they need to put in place in order to achieve security and privacy. It's just not, not within the realm of possibility that the vast majority of computer users would do that. So it has to be done for them. And it has to be built into the protocols and the operating systems. Um, 
And to this point, there's not been any commercial pressure. Uh, I mean, in places there have been. I mean, you can't be a bank and have someone steal all the money. And so there's spot places where there's more of a concern for security. But even with credit card companies, the fraud is just the cost of doing business. And it's, it doesn't really bother them. As long as it's at a sufficiently low level, even they don't want to spend the money on improved security. They just accept what happens as long as it's manageable. Um, and so there's very little, certainly the commercial providers on the internet don't want to give up sucking up all that information about you, which they can turn into money. So they have no incentive, and in fact, probably would be against uh, an effort to, to um, add, you know, re-engineer things with security as the first thought to the internet protocols and to operating system, to browsers, to, to things that connect. And I think he would push hard, push hard for that. I think he'd also be concerned about equity. Um, his view was that it should be ubiquitously available. And I think partly technology is taking care of that problem to a degree. The devices are cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And you know a lot of the so-called third world, you go look there and they live the way they did 20 years ago, but they have a cell phone. And they have some connection to the world. Um, but I think it's still, there's, there's great inequity in terms of access and, and affordability. And he would be concerned about that. Um, and I, I think he definitely would want, uh, certainly, all the universities of the world to sort of be attached for free. I mean, you know, if a country didn't have the um, cable connection to the world, he would want it to be provided. You know, by the UN or by somebody um, to connect people everywhere. Uh, maybe not absolutely everyone, but at least you know a core of people, so that great thinkers in funny places would not be left out of the conversation because they might be the precise ones who have the technological insight to create a breakthrough or some. And, and his goal was certainly to be as inclusive of anyone who might have that kind of insight. Um, but it was very much a, a knowledge of mankind oriented thing. I think he'd be concerned about censorship, the nation state interdiction of internet. So like if you think it's causing unrest, you just turn it off for your country. You turn it off for Egypt or, or, uh, what, or Iran or whatever. Um, and he'd be troubled that that's how countries had, that they had the power, that they, they um, and then abused it or used it to, to shut down. And I think also, originally, the internet was a much more egalitarian architecture um, in that you could take multiple paths to get someplace. You know, if some the server was down, the internet would figure out another way around that. And What's happened is there's been a lot of consolidation, and so the internet, for for major players like Google and Akamai and you know, people like that, or people like X, I mean Xfinity, uh, Time Warner, uh, these people have built their own network, their own internet um, that's not carrying the traffic of the world. It's just you know, being used as a, as a commercial advantage. They can get information to you quicker because they pushed it out to nodes all over the place. Um, and that gives them a competitive advantage. If you go try to, you know, buy your diapers at XYZ, who's on some backwater public network, um, it's not going to be as snappy and, and whatnot. And so the fact that there's a lot of internet that's uh, opaque to the general traffic, I think would have would have bothered him. Um, now, partly too. I mean, he wasn't the kind of guy who was. I mean, he was a very smart man, but he wasn't a businessman, and I think he didn't ever really put himself in the position of thinking that way. Because if he had, if he did, 
or if he were more of an economist or something like that, I think he could have foreseen that these commercial pressures would be, would be brought to bear. And, um, and even with email, um, before the World Wide Web, some companies tried to create private email. Um, in fact, one of the succeeding directors of IPTO, where my dad had been, eventually left and went back in the public and built a business on, because at that point, most corporations didn't have access to the internet. And so it was providing email, and it, you know, it was long enough ago, so that one of the features of this email was that you could email it to a printer that they owned, like in some locality, and then they would take the paper to somebody who wasn't on email. And uh, a number of com companies you know, did that. Uh, but then all of that was swept away by the fact that now you can do basically anything. Print plastic guns over the internet. Um, but um, anyway, I mean, I think that would be his, his set of concerns. Um, and he, he, but I think it would be most troubled by nation, nation state behavior where, uh, where the NSA is exploiting it uh, as a surveillance means and other governments do that. I mean, it seems to be par for the course, uh, at least in relatively advanced countries. And I think he'd be very troubled by that. <laughs>